I tried, the more I Welcome fall. to The Liberating Secret with your host, author and teacher, Sylvia Pierce. The Liberating wall. Secret is dedicated to revealing the mystery the of the gospel, which is Christ in you, in the I only see. hope of glory. Let's join Sylvia a Pierce for today's lesson. Outside, Welcome to The Liberating Secret. My name is Sylvia Pierce, and I'm so glad to be with you again today. I hope you have been following this series. This series is called Discovering the Lie. Wow, the lie that we are independent selves able to conquer our own addictions, our own problems, our own flesh, able to conquer with power of our own. Wow. That's a, that's a hard lesson to learn. took me a long time to realize that I was as powerless as I was hopeless before I was saved. I was hopeless before I was saved without Christ, and I am powerless without His Holy Spirit using me and living the life through me. Now, why? Why do we believe this lie? We believe it because we adopted it during the fall of Satan. Uh, uh, sorry. During the fall of Adam, Adam actually lost his mind and adopted Satan's false identity. So this is all about identity. Who do you say you are? Who do you think you are? You see? All right. I say, well, yes, I'm Sylvia Pierce, but am I just Sylvia Pierce? Well, the Bible says that I've been crucified with Christ. Sylvia Pierce lives, but that Sylvia Pierce is a vessel and with no power of my own. And the life that I live is Christ living in that vessel. And it's him that has the power, him that has the wisdom, him that has the understanding, the might, you see, and the mind of Christ, and the new me and the new identity. So is it really me? No, it's not really me living any longer. It's Christ living through this uh, simple human vessel. And that's really what the Christian is today. Well, you know what? It takes a lot for us to know that. Sometimes it costs you everything. You know why? Because we've always thought, I'm just me. I, uh, God's going to help me, or he's going he's to give me the power, or he's going to, uh, if I try hard, then he's going to be happy with me. If I, it, you know, the more I try, the better I'm going to be. But you, you, you know yourself, if you've done that for very long, you're going to be a failure. Now, let me tell you, I promised last time I would tell you this story. I went down to the Lord's Kitchen. I'm in Louisville, Kentucky. That's where I live. And I went downtown in Louisville to the Lord's Kitchen. Well, all kinds of people show up. And I love ministering there. I, I love that. It's one of my favorite things. And there was a man there. And uh, I was handing out some, like, trifolds, you know, that it folds up in one paper but actually it had a lot of truth on it. And it was like the affirmation of faith. Many of you all maybe already have seen that on my website, the affirmation of faith. It's wonderful. Well, when I passed it to this man, he says, no, it's just a recipe. And I couldn't understand what he meant at that time. But I looked at him and I perceived that he was very skeptical. And so I said that to him. It just kind of popped out of my mouth. And I said, I don't know who you are, but I believe you're very skeptical. And he tried to tease with me a little bit and say, no, no. So finally, I walked over to him, and I put my hand on his shoulder, and he looked up at me, and he says, I'm already a Christian. I'm a Christian. I said, that's wonderful. I said, then why are you so skeptical? Because I wasn't going to give up on that. The Holy Spirit gave me that about him. And he said, and he said you're getting... You're getting too close to me now, meaning I was getting too close to his problem. And finally, he said, I'm skeptical about myself. Oh, his name was Tom. I said, oh, Tom, you know, you know why you're skeptical about yourself? Because you don't trust yourself, right? Right. Why? Well, because when I trust myself, most of the time it never works out. That's your problem. You are putting faith and trust in your own self apart from Christ. And every time you put faith and trust in your own self 
as if you are apart from Christ, you will always fail. I said, I want to tell you something. I was skeptical about myself too. Of course I was. I said, I love Jesus with all my heart, but I hated me. I could not live the life. I could not manifest victory. I could not manifest peace that passes all understanding. I could not understand manifest the fruits of the Spirit, peace, love, joy. Now, I could occasionally, but it was not a, a, a flow inside of me where that without even thinking I'm manifesting the life of Christ. I was not because I really didn't even believe, hardly knew that Christ was in me. Well, I said he was in me, but I was not trusting his life in me. I was trusting my own life as if I was independent from Christ. I said, I want to tell you, as long as you trust yourself, you will fail. It's total failure right there. I said, you can put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is your life. Now, if you tr put your trust in him, the Holy Spirit will manifest peace, love, joy, long-suffering. The fruit of the Spirit will start flowing. You will start getting a released life a life where you're not struggling to improve yourself. You don't have to improve the vessel. And you already have the life of Christ within you. It's just you're not functioning from that life. You're drawing from your own source, from your as if you have a life of your own. You see, that's the problem. That's believing that you're still an independent self. That's believing the lie instead of the truth of who you really are in Christ. That's the whole problem in Christianity. We're believing this great big lie. Well, let me tell you another story because I'm going to go into Romans 7. One time I was in a huge church in Memphis, Tennessee, not here in Louisville, in, in Memphis, Tennessee. Okay. <clears throat> I was talking to the pastor and I was telling him this truth of this lie in Romans 7 and how Paul moved into the truth in Romans 8. And he said, but Sylvia, are you saying that we can really experience that? I said, I sure am. He said, do you realize that 98% of all the uh, ministers and the theologians and even the uh, seminaries are not teaching that? I said, I sure do know that. I said, but I've discovered the liberating secret. And he looked at me like, who in the world do you think you are? And I said, well, and I didn't really say this back to him, but I thought to myself, I'm a simple housewife that simply believes the truth of uh, that Romans 7 is a great big lie about ourselves. And what Paul discovered when he went through his Roman except 7 experience, because you see, most people teach we never get out of Romans 7. We stay in Romans 7 the rest of our life. We're always struggling. We're always trying. We're trying to improve ourselves. Maybe if I read more my Bible more, maybe if I'm more disciplined, maybe if I pray more, maybe if I give my money more, maybe, you know, that's all conditional living. That's conditioning on my behavior. You see? You see, so much of Christianity is behavior modification modifying my behavior and maybe I'll be a better Christian. That's still depending on myself as if I'm an independent self. I'm not an independent self. I'm in union with the true self, which is Christ in me, the only hope of glory. Oh my goodness, people of God. When you know this truth, sometimes we glibly say that, yes, Christ is in me. We memorize scripture. If you've gone to church for a while, a long time, or you've been a Christian, you memorize scripture, and it becomes generic. You don't realize it's not a living reality. And basically, we say it, but it's kind of more of a theory to us, or a head knowledge, more than it is a living reality. It's meant to be a living reality. We're meant, we are not meant to live in the lie of Romans 7. Do you realize if you would get out your Bible, and I recommend you look in the King James Bible, because I think it's a little bit more clear. I'm not making that a law that you have to have the same Bible that I have, but if I'm teaching out of it, it, it kind of makes sense that you could read out of it. It's going to, you're going to see what I'm saying easier. Okay, in Romans 7, 
I got my little pen out and I circled all the eyes. I, 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 I. Do you know there's 41 eyes? Maybe some of them are me's, but that's the same thing. It's a misplaced identity. Now remember, Adam lost his mind. He lost his true identity at the fall. Now, <laughs> you see, through Christ, he's going to give, he gave us a whole new identity. Because we don't live any longer. We have his identity. It's Christ that lives inside of us. So identi the identity truth is the main truth for you to really know your liberation. You know that you don't have to strive and struggle and try to defeat Satan and war with Satan all the time. Not that we uh, don't have spiritual warfare. We do. But Satan is constantly trying to tell you the lie. He's trying to twist the truth into a lie and twist it back on you to try to make you perform. Because the secret is right in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 56. The strength and power of sin is the law, is us trying to keep, trying to be good, trying to modify our behavior through self-effort. That's still believing the lie of independent self. I'm not, if you are a born-again Christian, you are not independent. You're a dependent self, totally depending on the life of another that came inside of you the minute you were born again and declares that's who you really are. And because we don't know that, our minds have not been renewed to it. In Romans 12, 1 and 2 tells us the only way we're going to be transformed is renew our mind to the truth. And when you do that, let me tell you the power of faith, the power of declaring what God says. When you start declaring what God says about you, then the transformation happens. But it's going to be not by power, nor by your might, but it's going to be by the Holy Spirit absolutely transforms you and causes you to walk in peace that passes all understanding, a joy unspeakable, full of glory, and, and no more sin consciousness. I sin every day. Oh, poor me. I sin every day. I do wrong every day. I confess every day. And somehow we think, oh, well, I, don't, I can't be perfect anyway. Let, let me tell you, the Bible is saying, Jesus said it and Peter says it. P Jesus said, be ye perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, a lot of people just want to dismiss it. Oh, that's just law. Well, Jesus was saying it to the Pharisees, but he's also saying it to us. You see, so he's saying it, it, it is true. It is true. I'm meant to be complete in Christ. Okay, Peter says, be ye holy as your heavenly Father is holy. Okay, holiness, righteousness, completeness, perfection, not outer perfection. If we try to measure up and try to be outwardly perfected, you're going to be trusting yourself. You're going to fail all the time. That is, I would be skeptical about that. I can't do that. You can't do that. Jesus couldn't do that. Do you realize Jesus said, of my human self, I can do nothing? How come we Christians think we're greater than Jesus? How come Paul thought that in Romans 7? I'm going to conquer myself. I'm going to rise up and do it. I'm going to have the power. I should have the power. I should try harder. I'm going to work at it. If I work at it hard enough, I'm finally going to get to that perfection, that completeness that the Bible talks about. Well, work as much as you will, but it's going to be dead works. It will end up not pleasing God, and you will not be pleasing yourself. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God, and there's no way you're going to be satisfied yourself. The only way you're going to be satisfied is if you walk in the Spirit, trust in the new identity that you have through Christ, because you no longer live. He lives in you. You've got His identity. You've got his power, his name, and we don't we, don't we certainly pray in Jesus' name, but we don't really identify ourselves with his name. We've got a new name. We've got a new identity. We are a new creation. Why are we still walking like the old man? The old man is out. We're still acting like we still have the old man. 
Why? Because we really believe we still do have the old man. The Bible says that the old man is out, the new man is in. And let me read that, and I promise you I'm going to go into Romans 7. I promise you. But let me, let me read you this first. It's in Colossians chapter 3, verse 9. It says, Lie not one to another. Why? <clears throat> Seeing that you have put off the old man. It happened at the cross. The finished work of the cross, you were delivered from the old man. You weren't just saved because of the cross. Salvation really means you've been delivered. You've been delivered from the powers of darkness and translated into a brand new kingdom, and you're called by that name, a new creation. You identify yourself as a new creation and quit identifying yourself when you, with your flesh, because that's what we do. Look at, the, look at this. what this verse says in Colossians. He, um, lie not one to another. Quit lying and saying the lie about you, about yourself, or about your friends, or about your family members. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man. The old man was Satan in you. The new man is Christ in you. Now let me, what else does it say? With his deeds, those are the sins that are committed. Okay, the cross has delivered you from the root of sin and the fruit of sins. There's a difference between sin, which is the very root of or the very power that caused you to sin, the dark power that caused you to sin, caused you to be the sinner. Ephesians tells us we didn't walk by our own self. We walked by uh, what we thought about ourselves, <laughs> you see. We, and so we thought we were just an independent self. That's how we walked. But we had a spirit deceiving us, causing us to be the sinners that we really were. Now, are we responsible? Yes, you, you better believe we're responsible because we're identifying, we're liking our pride, we're liking our sins. A lot of people, I even say this, some people don't even want to deliver. They like their demons too much, you see. We're liking them, and we're agreeing with Satan. Where after we're saved, we better stop agreeing with Satan. You better start agreeing with God, and you better start realizing that what Satan tells you, you is a lie. What he's always told you is a lie. He's a liar from the beginning. There is no truth in him. You start believing the truth about yourself, and you're going to be walking as sons of God, as mighty sons of God, free from this lie of independent self, free from it. All right, let's go back to Romans 7. I want to show you where all the eyes are. I, 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 I. Let me tell you a secret. There's nothing said about the Spirit of God in Romans 7. There's a lot said about the Spirit of God and the, and, and the new creation inside you in Romans 8. So Romans 7 is believing this lie that Satan imparted to us years ago, making us think we're separate with God. When the truth is, that we are in union with Christ and he is your life. The Bible says in Colossians, you are dead. <laughs> the Bible says in Romans 6, 11, uh, it says, uh, the, uh, let me just read it because I don't want to quote it wrong. Romans 6, I'm sorry, verse 7, not 11, verse 7. For he that is dead is freed from sin. So you've got to see you died with Christ. You don't live any longer. You died with Christ. Galatians 2.20 says that. Colossians 3 says you are dead. And Christ, who is your life, when he appears, okay, now that could be talking about the second coming. It's true. It also could be talking about the, the, the realization of him appearing as your life, you see then you will be seated with him in glory is what it says. Well, that happens to us. We can know a new reality instead of an earthbound reality. We know our ascended authority, position in Christ, seated far above principalities in Christ. So the truth is this, you are dead. Satan says, no, you're alive. Try harder, try struggle, try a little bit harder. Maybe if you do more good things, you'll be a better person. He's tempting us to be good. So in Romans 7, we're trying to be good. Oh my goodness, now we're getting to the heart of our problem. Do you realize Satan was trying to be like God in the first place? Satan was going to 
take God's place. He says, I'm going to be like the Most High. Do you know what? That makes him a counterfeit. Only God can be God. Only God is the one independent self in the whole universe. He says, I am God and there is none else. And even the uh, the uh, the fallen wicked spirits that think, call themselves God, God says, you're a non-God. You don't even exist as far as I'm concerned. And he sh they shouldn't even exist as far as we're concerned. Now, we do know they, they exist, but they have no power over us unless we give it to them. And we're giving it to Satan all the time when we don't have to. All right. So, knowing you're dead is important. But if you st think you're still alive and you still can perform as if you're separate from God and separate from Christ as an independent being, then this is how you're going to talk. You're going to be like Paul in Romans 7. That's why he puts this in there so he can identify with us because we're all going to walk through this because we all have an unrenewed mind. Actually, Romans 8 calls it the carnal mind. And it says that mind is enmity against God. It's false thinking. It's stinking thinking is what it is. It's believing the lie. He's causing us to think his thoughts. So I always say, we have the heart of Jesus. We have the new nature. I'm a new creation. Uh, Christ lives in me, but I'm still thinking like the old man. So that man down at the Lord's kitchen got this liberating secret the other day. He got the secret. He doesn't live. He doesn't trust in a dead body because Romans 8 says the body is dead because of sin. You're beating your body up and trying to get your body to do something it can never do. You're hitting a dead horse, beating a dead horse as the expression goes. Oh, no. No, no, no. As long as you beat that dead horse and try to make yourself overcome yourself and try harder, this is what it's going to be. Paul says in Romans 7, this is how he starts. He's asking the question, what in the world is wrong with me? Why can't I live the Christian life? I don't understand myself. Maybe you've asked that same question. Maybe you want to know this liberating secret. Well, let's look at all these eyes. I, 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 this false identity that he still has. He's not believing the true identity, and we weren't either, and I wasn't either. I was defeated Christian. I constantly was trying to self-improve myself. I was trying harder. I always say I was trying to fix, change, and rearrange me and everybody in my family and everybody in my household. I was trying to get everything under control, and I was beating my own self up because I could not live the life, and I was beating everybody else up, and I want to tell you, it really wasn't even me beating my own self up. It was the accuser of the brethren, and I bit his lie and believed it and tried harder all the time, which totally defeated me. And it should. Thank God that it did. Romans 7, 7. That's where I'm going to start. What shall I say then? Is the law sin? What he's saying is, I've got a problem. Is it because law is there? The shoulds and oughts of what I should be, what I should look like, what I should perform. Is that my problem? He says, really, no. The law is not my problem. So many people are making that they hear a law and they want to beat up the law. He, he's got to be honest before God, and I think we all do. So he says, God forbid. No, it's not that. Nay, if I had known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law says thou shalt not covet. So you see, he's saying, I wouldn't even know that was wrong if the law didn't say thou shalt not covet. Now he's a Christian. He already knows that's wrong. But before he was a Christian, the law had to tell him. The outer law had to tell him. The Bible says the outer law is for people that are sinners. The outer law is not for the newborn uh, 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 child of God. The outer law is only meant to point us and point us to the fact that we need Christ in the first place. So after you're a Christian, you don't the law. The outer law is not for you. You know why? Because the Bible says in Romans 7, the beginning of Romans 7, 7 says we're dead to the law. Dead to all the shoulds and law and the shoulds and oughts of the outer law that constantly shouts at me and tells me I ought to do this, I ought to do that, I ought to try harder, I ought to strive more. You see, the Bible says we're dead to that. And we're joined to Christ. We're joined to His Spirit. 
You see, my friend, uh, my precious friend Fran, who lives in Hilton Head, says this. If you want to keep the outer law, you can't do it that way, as if you're separate from Christ. You can't do it that way. You're dead. You don't live any longer. Now, uh, Christ lives in you. So the only way to keep the law is to marry the lawyer. Well, that's what we've done. Through the cross, we're joined to Christ. We're, we're married to him. We're, we're joined to him. That's what it says in the first part of Romans 7 in verse um, 3. It says, so then... If when, uh, um, uh, let me read this. She shall, well, that's not where I want to start. It says in verse, chapter 7, verse 4. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you might be joined or married to another, even to him that was raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. That's what we all want. We want the fruit of the Spirit manifested through us. We don't want the works of the flesh. We want the fruit of the Spirit. All right, we're going to go into this next time, verse by verse. I promised you last time, but I always take a little diversion. So uh, next time, tune in, and we're going to go right verse by verse into Romans 7, and I'll show you what Paul discovers, the liberating secret there. Okay, thank you for joining me, and God may God richly bless you. Goodbye. I hope that you are being blessed by the liberating secret. If you would like to have for yourself my books, booklets, or any of my TV or radio series, check out our website's bookstore. Our TV shows are also on our YouTube site. And be sure to get the Liberating Secret app for your phone. We have an annual Louisville conference in June, as well as a biannual Women's Retreat at Polly's Island, South Carolina. Come for a weekend or a week of study, fun, fellowship by the ocean. We also have a weekly Bible study. See our website for times and location. My husband and Scott and I would love to come and share the liberating truth to your fellowship, church, or home group. Please call or contact us through the website. If you would like to donate to our ministry, make your checks out to Christ Our Life Ministries Post Office Box 43268, Louisville, Kentucky, 40253. Please pray for us, and we will pray God's very best for you.